Hi, I'm Manuel Paes, and today I want to talk about beyond engineering, the future of platforms. Specifically, I would like to address some of the challenges that I see in many organizations when we're trying to achieve faster flow of value to customers, but there isn't necessarily the awareness of how internal processes and the way we work actually impacts our ability to deliver to the customer quickly. It's great to be back at PlatformCon. One year ago, I spoke about what is platform as a product? What is this approach? What does it mean in terms of principles and practices? Um, and I got a lot of positive feedback of many organizations that are applying these ideas within engineering specifically um, and for internal developer platforms and other types of platforms. And it's been really helpful for them to move away from the idea of platform as a uh, somewhere where we standardize and we centralize some shared services to something that's really seen as a product with actual customers that were trying to improve their life. We're trying to provide a great usability for the platform in whatever form it might be, APIs, tools, or um, actual user interface, right? So it has been proven essentially that this approach of platform as a product is very helpful within engineering. and. Before I talk about how we might apply some of these ideas outside of engineering, I will do a short state of the union kind of um, speech, if you like, about where I see us as a community in engineering uh, one year later after last year's talk. If you don't know me, I'm Manuel Paisch. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, Team Topologies with Matthew Skelton. And as I was saying, I do believe the ways of working outside of engineering directly and indirectly impact our ability to deliver value to customers, have a, a fast flow of value, right? Meaning that we can take an idea or a customer request or something that the business would like us to um, experiment and take that all the way to the live environment systems and being used by the customers, right? <clears throat> so if we, if we think about how um, internal processes might affect this. If you think about, you know, if you have a complicated, you know, training approval process, or you have uh, difficulties with procurement processes to get be engaged with third parties that might offer some helpful tools or services that you need to actually um, be able to deliver faster with quality to your customers, um, then there isn't a direct impact at least on, um, on our ability to, to deliver, to achieve this fast flow of value, right? Um, so what I see in many organizations, this sort of divide, this abyss between our approach to fast flow within engineering, or I should say in some organizations, not all, and the way that other parts of the organization that are equally necessary and important, obviously uh, accounting, legal, HR, uh, even leadership, how they think, um, and how are they aware or not of these ideas of fast flow and blocking others um, and helping others achieve their goals and outcomes, right? Um, and I believe that's to a large extent because teams tend to optimize for their internal processes over the outcomes for the organization. And what happens is those internal processes, when you look at them in isolation, yes, it's good to optimize locally, but that optimization might not translate to improving the outcomes and improving our capacity to deliver um, quickly and you know, actually answering the customer needs. Um, I see a lot of friction of often, uh, you know, whether that's some you know, difficult processes we have to follow, we have to keep a lot of steps in mind. How do I request the training or how do I engage with the third party? What kind of contracts are needed? Um, who needs to approve what and when? Um, I've definitely had experiences, uh, you know, as, as an outsider, as a, as a provider to organizations where the process, whether that's invoicing or the initial procurement, um, is really cumbersome and puts on cognitive load for me to remember and, and understand all the steps necessary and for the organization itself, especially the teams who are not the specialists in that function, right? Who are not the legal specialists, they are not HR specialists. Uh, they just need 
uh, help to do their work in whatever uh, way, you know, recruiting or third party help, et cetera. This sort of frictions uh, probably sound a bit deja vu maybe to some of you. Um, and that's because when the DevOps movement started in 2009, Effectively, we went through a lot of these frictions within engineering, you know, development teams incentivized to uh, deliver features while ops teams were incentivized for stability. And so they didn't want uh, a fast pace of, of change to the systems. We had sort of similar problems with engineering that we've been able to make a lot of progress in the last decade or so. Uh, we've been addressing those frictions and obvious things like um, platform engineering and platform as a product approaches have been quite helpful um, in supporting others without blocking them. It's interesting that Patrick Debois, and I checked this with him before the talk, um, only recently he came up with his own definition of DevOps, where he says, everything you do to overcome the friction between silos is DevOps, and all the rest is plain engineering. Um, and it's not saying that plain engineering is not necessary. Obviously, it, it really is kind of the, the engine to support a lot of the, the good practices and, and approaches of DevOps. But the ultimate goal for him was, and I agree with him, is to remove friction between silos, have a smoother flow of uh, value to our customers. So maybe we can apply some of the things we learned with DevOps, platform engineering, et cetera, outside of engineering. Before we continue, though, it's, it's good to make sure we're on the same page about what we mean by platform, right? So I fully agree with Evan Botcher's definition of a digital platform as a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support, which are arranged as a compelling internal product. And embedded in this definition is this idea of platform as a product, right? And I think that is helpful for any kind of platform approach, even if it doesn't include tools, APIs, or actually running services. If we think of a platform as anything that helps other teams um, accelerate, reduce their cognitive load, then um, the idea of platform as a product is more broadly applicable, right? So I do believe it's a key pattern for overcoming the friction between silos, not only in engineering, but outside engineering as well. And the key point, I would say, is to start by treating others as your customers, right? Yes, they are your peers, they are your colleagues, and um, there are specific dynamics about that. You know, on one hand, it should be easier to reach out to them versus an end user or customer. And on the other hand, they might have demands that are different from an end customer. But fundamentally, this idea of I'm going to think about others as customers and not just people who have to follow my processes, right? So if I do that, I will look at what I offer rather than what I demand. So it's an interesting change of, of positioning. And I will be looking at what do my customers need? How do I improve the experience for them of going through my process or, or some kind of procedure that they need to follow, right? And understand why are they asking this and how do I make it easier for them to get what they need to, to deliver value to our end customers? Like I said, I want to do a little detour um, briefly to do a sort of state of the union of platform as a product uh, one year later. And this is inspired by John Willis, by the way, who used to do this state of the union um, for DevOps in the, in the early days. And um, essentially, you know, your mileage may vary. Some of these things might seem like science fiction still. Other things might, you might say, well, this is, we already do this in my organization. It's uh, trivial. But as a community, as a group, it's interesting to think about what have we gotten right and what do we still need to improve? So some of the things that I've seen at least evolve and you know progress uh, over the last year include a lot more focus on the user experience for the platforms, especially you know internal developer platforms and so on. In engineering, we now understand that it's not just about providing services, how easy it is to onboard, to consume, to understand why this service is helpful for the teams, right? Effectively, having the right tool for the job and also understanding that different people will do the, the same job differently, 
basically, right? Maybe we need different entry points, different approaches, even though what they're trying to do is, is fundamentally the same. We've made, and I believe there's a wider understanding that the platform really is not just a bucket of shared services, it's really um, an approach as a product that helps to manage cognitive load at scale, meaning that it helps the teams that are using the platform to have less to worry about, to remove some of the distraction um, and aspects of, of the work they do, um, which is simply um, very hard to deal with if you have hundreds of tools, frameworks you need to know about um, just to do, you know, to follow the life cycle of software, that's really difficult. And we have no capacity left to focus on the customers. So the platform helps reduce a lot of those uh, complexities by providing useful abstractions for our customers, our teams. In fact, a couple of years ago, the State of DevOps uh, report from Puppet, uh, Puppet Labs, found that highly evolved firms around DevOps use this combination of what we call streamlined teams or product teams um, with platform teams as the most effective way to manage cognitive load at scale. Effectively, they saw in the data that organizations taking this approach have a competitive advantage compared to others. I think there's more awareness as well of the need of having good product experience and product management inside uh, platforms, even technical engineering platforms. Maybe extensive experience is still something, uh, sort of an ambition, an aspiration. Maybe we could say some teams have relevant product experience, but maybe most teams, in fact, what I see is start to have some product experience. Um, it's still not nearly enough, in my opinion. We need a lot more. We need to bring senior people with a lot of product experience who have been in the trenches, maybe with you know end customer products not so technical but they know the things they, that you need to do to understand your customer base to prioritize the demands when you have a successful product and those are the things we need to bring into uh, technical platforms as well so i highly recommend um, organizations uh, start doing that now in terms of what we're still missing um I could do a whole talk about that, um, and it's normal, you know. This is a field that's evolving, but a, a few key things that I want to highlight are the fact that the boundaries of the platforms need to be more fluid. There's still this idea that whatever we define the platform is going to live there forever, and that essentially the platform keeps growing forever. Um, and while this is that is partially true, we shouldn't look at the platform boundaries as being so rigid because then they start potentially to block teams and increase their cognitive load. And that's when we sort of prematurely um, or too rigidly define, well, this service or this feature is in the platform and so we own it um, and other teams have to ask us for change. And that might work well in the beginning, but when, when the environment changes, it turns out that the product teams or streamline teams need faster changes to that service or functionality, especially when we're talking about business functionality um, that is in, the, in some kind of platform, then you might have a different pace between how the platform can change that service and how the streamline teams need that change, how quickly they need it. So you don't want that. You want at least to have the openness to say, okay, let's figure out what's a better way. Is this something that we should allow the product teams, streamline teams to change themselves or even remove from the platform and say, there are too many variants possibly of this functionality. Each team needs to figure out or they need to work together, figure out what they need, but cannot be in the platform. Essentially, it needs to be more flexible, what's in and out of the platform and what can we build on top of the platform as well? Obviously, we should use good approaches, you know, good API design and so on to make sure the platform is also as extensible as possible. Another problem I see is not being mindful of the cognitive load on the platform teams themselves. And so we need to be realistic about the capacity of platform teams. They have a lot on their plate from you know, how many tools and frameworks they might need to deal with um, and, and sort of abstract so that it makes life easier for the de development application and, and product teams um, to all the responsibilities they might have from, you know, actual doing the development of services uh, and those abstractions 
to operating them, making sure they're reliable and available, um, those platform services, to helping educate your customers. Because like I said earlier, it's not enough to have the service if people don't understand why is it useful to have a, an observability service, for example. What does that mean? How do I use it? How do I uh, integrate this in my workflow as a product team? Right. So you need to do some of that, that uh, education work as well. Um, and so a lot of different things that might be required from a, a single platform team. And so try to use simple approaches like time boxing, basically. Um, Define some target, how you want to spend your effort. Maybe we say, well, 50% development and operations, 30% education, uh, 20% on communication and sort of marketing the platform to other teams as well to show what we are what we offer. Um, and then the reality, you can measure how much do we actually spend on each part. And so if it doesn't match your target, what are the things you want to do um, with what you actually needed to do? Uh, then you know you can take some actions to try to you know what, whatever that might be. We need to reduce how much time we spend uh, uh, answering support questions. Then maybe we need to improve documentation. Um, it can be anything else, right? Uh, sometimes we can provide more value and not build as much, right? It might be that it's the documentation, the examples that are not, not easy to understand. It's not that the service uh, really needs to to change or that we need to add more features. Another aspect I see missing is this idea of trust boundaries. Um, to give you an example, I often see uh, organizations that have a platform tribe or department, right? And so all the teams working in some kind of platform are in the same department. So to some extent, this makes sense. The problem is that platform teams, more than, than almost any other team, need to build trust with the product teams and the teams using the platform. And that's going to be very difficult if we're working sort of isolation in our own tribe and then we just come out now and then to talk to others. And so we need maybe better approaches to the way we design the organization and especially the platform part um, to make sure we are aligned with trust boundaries that exist for any human being. We, we don't feel the same level of trust with a larger group than we do with a smaller group. We don't feel the same level of trust with someone that we've only seen uh, messages in the Slack or our chat tool, right? So we need to work on those things, make sure those connections are built over time and that kind of education work or enabling work from the platform, you know, training and talking to customers is really important. It's not a nice to have uh, people skill is really might make or break your platform success. Uh, the fact that you have built trust with the with, uh, customers and the product teams, right? So that's it in terms of state of the union. And let's get back then to this idea of what if outside of engineering, basically across the organization, we always think of others as our customers, even if they're colleagues and, and, and peers from other parts of the organization. And these ideas I just talked about in uh, of platform as a product, how can they, could they help um, if we're trying to adopt this platform mindset outside of engineering? Well, let's look at some examples. What about compliance as a platform? And forget for a second about the bananas in there. I'll I'll come back to that. Um, what if we had a compliance platform? How could it look like? Well, maybe a common type of service that we could have is some uh, way to search for applicable regulations for our domain or the domain of our, the product we built. What kind of regulations exist? Uh, how, what is the impact? What is the context for this regulation so that we can understand what we need to do? Um, what is the validity of this regulation? So on, right? An easy way to search for that uh, with the guidance around it as well. Like when do you need to uh, ensure you are compliant with this kind of regulation? Maybe another service could be some checklists for auditing to make sure our service or application is compliant uh, and will will you know likely uh, pass some kind of auditing uh, request, right? And this might be just some artifact, some documentation guidance that we use, or might be an actual running service that we could test um, our application against. Obviously, that's more involved and it could start just something simple like a 
proper guidance and context. Turns out this already exists. There is an organization I talked to uh, where what they do is interesting. It's not related to software. It's about labeling, uh, you know, nutrition labels and other kind of labeling for uh, food items. And therefore, turns out the bananas labeling is actually fairly complicated. And so the people doing that on the ground and, and certifying, etc., they need to understand the regulations in different countries, different regions. And, and so they actually have, they don't call it the platform. They actually have some people, a team that works on making sure this is easy to understand, that providing these regulations as a kind of service to those, to those teams or people doing the work uh, on the ground, let's say. Another example, what about legal? Could we think about legal as a platform? What would that mean? And just to make sure we're on the same page, it doesn't mean that suddenly all we do is can be turned into a platform as a product approach. Obviously, there's a lot of work around legal that it cannot be turned into a platform. But what we're trying to do is maybe a significant percentage of what we do uh, with our processes um, can be done more in a self-service fashion by other teams and not depend on us as the legal team or any kind kind of team that I'm talking about, right? Um, it's also not meant to say, well, now we provide this platform so every other team can be a legal expert. Obviously, um, I strongly discourage that. That's probably going to be very uh, risky. Uh, it's just to make sure kind of common use cases can be easily self-served and, uh, again, contribute to a much faster flow of change whenever we need, for example, a new contract with a third-party provider. So in this example, maybe the legal platform is something which provides some service around uh, standard types of contracts like non-disclosure agreements or things like that, right? Um, so that the teams that need something fairly standard, trivial, maybe we need to engage uh, and contract some, you know, consulting services or training services, we can have, you know, quick access with the right context and guidance to some contracts that are needed to be in place. Again, I've seen some examples of this, uh, one particular example in a large uh, retailer across the world, and their legal team, I could I could see from the way they were uh, presenting, um, the, the, the um, in this case was about this type of contracts, NDAs, um, that they were trying to make life easier for those teams that were that needed to do the NDA with the third party. Um, another example could be leadership as a platform. What if leadership, obviously part of their work would be how do we help teams be able to understand better our strategy, better understand if we are aligned to that and what should we be focusing on? Maybe we could have some services around, you know, maybe some strategy boards with, you know, a way to uh, the right questions and the right uh, things to consider for any team to figure out if we're going the right direction, if we're aligned to what is the, the goal of the organization. Maybe some metric service, which again, might not be something running, but just some examples of metrics that are useful, how to measure certain things, what not to measure, how to interpret metrics. Um, that could be helpful um, as a leadership platform service. Again, it turns out this, I've already seen at least one example of this, and I know there are more, uh, where this uh, consulting company in Norway effectively tried to apply team topologies to the whole organization. And so leadership became uh, what they call a, a team strategy, where they have this sort of platform approach. They're trying to help teams do things around strategy and metrics in a more self-service way, rather than telling them, um, you know, controlling and, and, and telling them exactly what to do. Now, the problem with this, even in these early examples, is that sometimes we lack adequate team interactions for effective platform evolution because it's fairly easy to design, to have these diagrams and have this approach and put it in place. And that's great and very helpful, but then as the needs change, as teams come to us and say, actually, this is not the right uh, contract that I need, I need a different version, are we as a sort of platform outside of engineering open and ready to have the right interactions, whether that's uh, collaborating, facilitating, et cetera, right? 
So in the case of legal as a platform, what I've seen is that in this actual real life example, um, the team that needed a new type of NDA because it was it wasn't a good fit what was in the platform um, couldn't achieve it couldn't get that that new version because the, the the legal team was not open to the fact that there are different use cases coming and that we should address them or at least provide a way to for teams to to implement them and so there was a lack of collaboration here happening um, in compliance as a platform. I've also seen the fact that um, again, this was this is you know ideal, but then maybe the, those teams, especially if they're not experienced with regulations, they might actually need help to facilitate that, that knowledge and understand uh, more about the regulations before they can actually um, use them, right? And understand in which context do we need to do what. Effectively, what we need is for um, to have some shared values to play well together, right? So that we understand um, across the organization that this sort of platforms are going to need to evolve. We're going to need to have uh, different interactions in place depending on you know what are the needs of our customers. This is something that Byron Miller from Red Hat was talking about in a Twitter shared uh, um, last year, that it's not about autonomy doing what you want. It's agency to operate with safety uh, and being able to do the work you need um, efficiently with the encoded values that are jointly shared between, in this case, uh, legal or HR or whatever um, part of the organization and, and the rest of the teams, right? You need to have some shared values. Okay, this is how the platform is going to evolve. This is what we're going to do. Um, and so I think it's quite important to have this uh, well-defined. So some examples that I think are important of um, shared values include prioritizing fast flow of value to one customer. So when we're changing the platform or defining it, we should be thinking about how do these services help um, reduce blockers and improve the flow. Unblock others through curated self-service patterns, right? So understand that it's not just about providing some service and let others use it. It's actually understanding how are they going to use it? How do we make it easier to understand? Number three, the platform should be open for change and Teams should be open to collaborate when we discover there are new needs or variations of what we have that we need to, to cover, right? Um, we cannot just say no, you know, whatever is in the platform, and if it's not in platform, then no, you cannot do it. That's not um, really acceptable uh, in, in, in modern days when we know the context inside and outside of the organization changes so quickly. Number four, we should optimize for adoption and discoverability of our platform in whatever um, function we're, we're providing, right? Um, in some way, we need to sort of market and make sure people know there's a, you know, some kind of legal service that we can use or some um, leadership service that we can use, right? Make sure it's as discoverable as possible. And lastly, enable others by meeting where they are today. Understand that not every team knows a lot about uh, compliance or legal. And so you might have some that are quite experienced and other teams that really are new. So you cannot sort of apply the same approach to every team. Even if you have a platform, you need to educate some teams more than others. You need to cater for uh, new needs and, and, and new ways to explain uh, how the platform works. So I hope that this talk was useful, that it sort of shed some light on some of these problems. And hopefully when you encounter this sort of divide in your organization uh, next time, that maybe you can plant the seed of sort of understanding, explain some of ideas of platform as a product to other parts of the organization, maybe even help them figure out how could, what could we start providing in a more self-service and blocking way. Right, And maybe in a few years, this future of platforms will come true. And if you want to know more about the ideas of team topologies, fast flow, platform as a product, you can check our online video-based academy. And we have different learning paths around platform, 
And we have a special discount code for PlatformCon attendees, PlatformCon 2023, and you get a 15% discount on any of the Academy courses or bundles. Thank you very much.